the the Once again, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, we are having some technical issues, but we'll, uh, we'll continue nonetheless. Um, so I am going to assign um, to co-hosts so that, you know, hopefully the program will continue. Um, just give us a second so that, you know, I can try and set up our Facebook stream at least, so we can hopefully continue on uh, a bit there. Um, we wanted to to express our gratitude to all the attendees that are joining us here on Zoom and that are joining us on Facebook in just about a minute, hopefully, um, so, so that we can have an informative program uh, ahead. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, once again, thank you for your patience. We will be starting in a minute, inshallah, God willing. <clears throat> I don't know how many, it seems like, you know, we have a participant from across the region, not only in the Pennsylvania region, but we've been having storms and that has been impacting connectivity. Um, so um, with that, uh, we will hopefully be starting soon. All right, in the meantime, um, what I will do is perhaps I'll invite uh, our executive director, Jacob Bender, to, uh, to say a few words about Care Philadelphia to all the attendees who are kindly joining us here. Um, Jacob, uh, why don't you uh, go ahead and then maybe do that. And in the meantime, uh, I'm working on the, the Facebook live stream and it's slowly coming alive, but we may need just another minute. Jacob, your voice is muted. CARE is a national organization with 33 chapters around the country. Um, and the organization is approximately 20 years old. Uh, the chapters 33 again are spread out all over the United States. Uh, I have the honor uh, to being the director here in Philadelphia for the last um, seven, uh, eight years. CARE is primarily a domestic organization dealing with Islamophobia uh, and discrimination against uh, Muslim Americans. However, on occasion, um, when we realize that our brothers and sisters are being persecuted, we organize um, events um, such as this one, such as um, next week uh, dealing with um, uh, Kashmir, and two weeks ago we did a webinar on Palestine. So these are some of the activities that we um, undertake, 
And we are really glad that both of you um, are here today to participate in this program. So welcome. Ahmed, it, it's all yours. Uh, thank you, Jacob, for that. What I will suggest doing is because we have quite a few attendees here on Zoom with us, um, um, what I will suggest is we can get started. And hopefully, the, once the live stream is set up, uh, the, uh, our audience there can catch up. And we will, of course, make the, the full program uh, through the recording available as well. So I want to, to thank uh, again, Jacob and both of our speakers, uh, Rushan Abbas of Campaign for Uyghurs and, um, and Elise Anderson from uh, Uyghur Human Rights Project uh, for joining us today. I want to also give a shout out and thank uh, Guangxin Ha from Haverford College uh, with whom and with the Hereford Center at Haverford College, we have been cooperating on a connected a project called um, Contest of the Fruits that centers around an ancient Uyghur text and Uyghur civilization. Um, so Gangshin kindly reconnect me with, with, with Elise and uh, with Dr. Rishat Abbas, a local Pennsylvania-based Uyghur American leader. We have been blessed to, to work and to exchange ideas. We've been able to, to bring uh, Rishan Abbas, one of the leading voices of Uyghur Americans um, in DC, Virginia area with us today. Uh, so what we are looking at is a complex and a long-standing uh, issue. And yet, having said that, I would caution us against making this just an international conflict uh, issue. Sometimes that leads us to dehumanize the subjects, the very individuals that go through and experience hardship uh, through this process. What I wanted us to do is to start off with um, a a session, a section where um, both of our speakers uh, can briefly introduce themselves and their work um, so that our audience, uh, those who may not be familiar with them and their expertise, their backgrounds uh, can be familiar with that. And then we'll go into a series of questions and answers. And we, of course, invite our audience members to also please post their questions uh, to, uh, to us um, um, and to our speakers um here uh, on zoom and once the um uh, and the once the the facebook uh stream starts uh with that i want to um i want to invite uh Rishan abbas um to uh, to kindly take the first step and introduce us a little bit about herself um, and her trajectory coming into the United States um, uh, as an Uyghur, um, uh, for Uyghur American here and, and her work. And then we'll go to, to Dr. Elise Anderson. Thank you so much, Ahmed. Thank you, Jacob and the CARE Philadelphia for uh, setting up this panel, giving us this opportunity to uh, raise awareness, highlight this uh, active genocide against the Uyghur people, for instance. Uh, I started my activism work while I was a student um, co-organizing the uh, pro-democracy demonstrations at my university in uh, 1985 and 1988 in East Turkestan, which is called Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region by the uh, Chinese authorities today. Xinjiang is the name given to our homeland by uh, uh, by China, Chinese government after the occupation. Uh, it means new territory, a name which is inaccurate at best and insulting at worst to the Uyghurs. So we refuse to use that. Since my arrival in the United States in 1989, uh, I have advocated for Uyghur rights and I also co-founded the first Uyghur organization uh, in the US in early 90s and also helped establish the Uyghur American Association, which is uh, my brother, Dr. Rishad Abbas, is one of the co-founders and the, um, also a longtime advocate for Uyghur people. Um, I was also privileged to work as the first Uyghur reporter for Radio Free Asia, broadcasting daily to the Uyghur region uh, when the service was initially launched. And I have also worked as a linguist and a translator and I was honored to be involved in the uh, translating and also resettling 
of the 22 Uyghurs who were mistakenly in Guantanamo. Um, I can just keep going. I don't know how much to do. Uh, well, no, since the no. um, last few years, um, I uh, uh, found that uh, the campaign for Uyghurs in uh, 2009, uh, 2017 to advocate for the uh, human rights and the democratic freedoms after the situation in Eastern deteriorated rapidly with a million people in the concentration camps. Now it went up to uh, more than three millions. I guess I, guess I can talk about the organization in the, uh, later. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much for that, uh, Shannon. Um, uh, Dr. Anderson, Elise, uh, again, um, uh, tell us a little bit about your background. Uh, you're an academic specializing on, on agriculture civilization. You have spent many years um, in the region. Um, so a little bit about yourself and your work. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. And thank you to you um, and to all of CARE for inviting me to be part of this panel, for organizing it in the first place. And thanks to all of you out in the ethers who are watching along with us right now. So I am perhaps very obviously to all of you, not Uyghur myself. I was born and raised in Oklahoma in a tiny rural town, actually. Um, and I did not know who Uyghurs were for the first 20 years of my life. But as a college student, as an undergraduate, when I was studying music, um, I was looking for some reason to keep me away from home for the summer. <laughs> and I ended up teaching English in Urumqi uh, many, many moons ago. Um, I hated teaching English, <laughs> if I'm being really frank about it, but I absolutely was fascinated by Uyghurs, by Uyghur culture, by Uyghur music, and I thought, wow, if I get a chance to study Uyghur language and Uyghur music someday, I think I'd really like to do that. And so I just ended up doing it. I went to graduate school at Indiana because it was one of the places, one of the few places in the U.S. where I could start to study the Uyghur language. I learned Uyghur, I learned Chinese, I spent my summers going to the region to Urumqi, to Kashka, um, and learning about Uyghur music, trying to learn the language better. Uh, and then I went to do dissertation research for my PhD uh, in 2012 and stayed until the middle of 2016. So I've I lived in, you know, a Uyghur community. I was so fortunate and, and blessed truly to be able to live in a Uyghur community for years of my life. I'm studying a form of traditional music called muqam mostly, but also learning a lot about pop music and culture and life in that place. Um, upon coming back to the U.S., you know, the, I very quickly saw, along with other people who specialize in this region of the world, and along with my Uyghur friends and colleagues, that the situation was deteriorating really rapidly, and in a way that even the most cynical of us did not ever quite expect would happen. And so um, I've decided since finishing my PhD, to you know, move into working in human rights and to working in advocacy and you know, not staying silent and saying, okay, how can I contribute to this cause? Can we, as this village that it's going to take to address this problem, like what can we do and how can I be a part of it? Um, so I still have one foot sort of in academia. Um, I also perform, I translate and Pretty much everything I do is connected to Uyghurs and Uyghur rights, Uyghur music and culture, and you know this bigger um, crisis and and village of people who are trying to solve it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I guess I can turn it back over to talk about our organizations, maybe. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you so much uh, for the release, and definitely we'll we'll be very interested to hear more about you know your research and how that's connected to your work. Yeah, so if you can come back to, to Roshanna Bas of Campaign for Uyghurs. Um, Roshanna, if you could um, tell us a little bit about um, 1989 to today, uh, what has been your work, not only with Campaign for Uyghurs, but, but other uh, work and uh, what are some of the differences in terms of the, the awareness around 
the, the Uyghur people in the United States since then? Um, when I came to United States in 1989, basically uh, there were um, just a handful of Uyghur people here living in the United States. Um, uh, a few families came uh, before that, actually, back in the uh, 60s, 70s, from Turkey or from uh, uh, Pakistan and the, uh, the other countries. But um, when I came over uh, after 1979, uh, when China established diplomatic relationship with the United States, uh, we were one of the first pioneers to come as a students in, to the United States. Um, I, me and my brother, we both came in 1989. And then 1990, when Baron Massey care happened, um, uh, I started my advocacy work here in the United States. And I have been always advocating uh, for uh, the, the Uyghur people's human rights. Um, as I mentioned, um, my brother is one of the founding members of the Uyghur American Association and the vice president. And I was uh, also elected twice as the vice president of the Uyghur American Association. Um, I never stopped uh, doing advocacy work as like at the side, not as a full-time job, but just doing it at the side uh, all these years. But um, as I mentioned earlier, we founded the campaign for Uyghurs in, in 2017 when Chinese government was holding more than a million Uyghurs in the concentration camps, but uh, I was not in the, uh, in the media, it's not being covered. Nobody was paying attention. The government was not really, um, like people were not knowing exactly what was happening. Um, that's why, you know, since we uh, founded the campaign for Uyghurs, we have been advocating for the uh, human rights and the democratic freedoms of the Uyghurs and the other Turkic people in East Turkestan. And since its inception, uh, we have um, led actually the One Voice, One Step initiative in 2018, uh, March and 2018. And the, uh, uh, it's actually a protest um, the, for the actions of the Chinese regime. And the, on the same day, 14 countries and 18 cities um, that the, in the event you know, the protest lasted for more than 22 hours around the globe. And they, uh, my sister and my aunt were abducted in the September 2018, six days after I spoke publicly about the uh, conditions of the camps and outlining the fate of my in-laws. Both of them are unusual targets. They are not famous, they are not educators, writers, or uh, scholars. Um, neither has traveled to any of the foreign uh, Muslim majority countries, and they both speak Chinese fluently. And these are some of the excuses why Uyghurs are sent to the camps. And my aunt was released a few months later, but it's almost two years now. The next month, it will be two years. There is absolutely no information on my sister's whereabouts. My sister, uh, Dr. Gulshan Abbas, is a retired medical doctor, and she doesn't need any kind of vocational training. Uh, therefore, I can firmly say here that uh, her abduction is guilt by association. And they, uh, you know, my sister became the victim of uh, CCP's reprisal for our activism here in America. And since then, I have quit my job in the September last year on one year anniversary of my sister's abduction, and I became a full-time advocate now. And our organization uh, works closely with uh, lawmakers, officials, academics, and the other grassroots uh, organizations, and they uh, raise awareness um, in the media, and they, uh, we work to mobilize groups to take tangible actions against Chinese regime. And we have advocated raising uh, a support for the uh, uh, Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act, as well as now asking support for the current uh, Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. And we are also involved in the congressional working groups, forums, and the international religious uh, uh, freedom uh, platforms, and even giving recommendations to congressional committees and foreign government bodies, uh, as well as uh, US embassies in overseas 
about the plight of the, the Uyghurs and in light of a COVID-19 pandemic now, we continue to maintain our uh, activism through media, and social media, and the online presentations. And we conduct advocacy efforts in uh, multiple languages now, mainly concentrating in Turkish, Arabic, and the uh, English, but uh, as well as we have Spanish uh, and also um, uh, uh, in uh, yeah, Chinese as well. And however, prior to the pandemic, um, Campaign for Uyghurs actively attended um, you know, conferences and religious forums, local, regional, and international forums and the, uh, sent its uh, representatives to maximize the impact of um, its outreach and advocacy efforts. And this has effectively um, bolstered the campaign for Uyghurs outreach, both in the public and the uh, government spheres, and the created movement in the uh, right direction, uh, having China held accountable. Currently, and we released materials, um, well, actually the recent report uh, entitled Genocide in East Turkestan, which is in English, Turkish, and the, we are working on Spanish and the Arabic version, which outlines the, uh, the ways in which the brutal actions of the uh, Chinese regime meet the conditions of genocide under the uh, Geneva Convention on the uh, prevention and the punishment of the crime of genocide ratified in 1948. So um, since our organization you know, places a high emphasis on the need for urgent uh, uh, action, and so we have been among the one of the first to use the word genocide since the beginning of last year. Uh, we already recognized that was active genocide. So there is no need to shy away from that um, because, uh, uh, you know, if we wait for the aftermath, to have the international community to declare in such as that will be, you know, that would happen too late. It is genocide. 13 tons of Uyghurs here seized at the US Customs and the Border Control recently. 13 tons of hair, just imagine that. This is a hardcore physical evidence of this genocide. So what else are we waiting for? You know, my question is, images of the mass executions and gas chambers to be broadcasted by China. Already, there are news reports on the uh, building of crematoria next to those uh, concentration camps for, this, um, for a culture and religion that doesn't practice cremation. So the never again is happening all over again, and we have a lot of work to do. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mushan, um, for that. Uh, and we'll come back to, again, some of the themes that you have um, highlighted. Um, uh, Dr. Anderson, at least if I may also request you maybe to, to, to tell us a little bit about, um, again, you know, in connection to your work, um, the work of uh, Uyghur Human Rights Project, um, your role in it, um, and the landscape within which you, you, you both are operating. Hey, sure. Okay. Um, I'll start with talking a little bit about UHRP, the Uyghur Human Rights Project. Awesome. I have been working at UHRP since December of last year, 2019. So, um, not even a year yet, it's, and it's been quite a year, but I specifically am working on projects dealing with human rights documentation and research and also capacity building for grassroots advocacy uh, and for information verification and dissemination, evidence verification and dissemination. UHRP um, is a research-based advocacy organization. So we do research using primary and secondary sources um, on issues particularly pertaining to the human rights of Uyghurs with an eye toward impacting policy and also spurring on grassroots action, right, by um, just individual community members all across the United States and the world and also civil society organizations and so forth. Up until really recently, UHRP was, which is based in Washington, D.C., I'm speaking to you from D.C. today, um, but up until recently, UHRP was mostly North America focused, although we've kind of started 
expanding um, who we're talking to and you know who we're in conversation with and collaborating with in more recent time. So we publish reports, oh, we're talking full length reports, you know, 30, 40 or more pages in some cases, briefings, statements, and um, many other types of writing in mostly English and Chinese right now, although we're also expanding into other languages as well. Um, and all of what we publish has an eye toward defending the civil, political, social, cultural, and economic rights of Uyghurs and other people in the Uyghur homeland according to international human rights standards. Um, and, you know, of course, that's just a very broad level explanation of what we do. If I got down to the nitty gritty of the day to day, it would be a lot. Right. But again, our eye is always toward how can we impact policy and how can we also spur action from the grassroots to, you know, the highest levels of government and multilateral action. Um, and just for a few examples of our recent reporting, we, we recently re released a report on um, disinformation. So how is Chinese state media uh, not just misinforming, but disinforming, you know, narratives and the broader conversation about what's happening to Uyghurs globally. We were released a report about uh, the city of Kashgar and the transformation it has undergone at the hands of the Chinese state, and what that says about Uyghur life and the future for Uyghurs. Uh, we were involved in research on the Karakash document or the Karakash list, one of those leaked documents out of China that was released earlier this year. Uh, we've done work on the coronavirus situation for Uyghurs. We have a lot of ongoing research reports, uh, a, a lot of ongoing research topics in process at any given moment. Um, mm -hmm. And in some ways that is, you know, very similar to my academic background <laughs> and, and my academic work, which like I said, has mostly focused on um, Uyghur cultural expression and Uyghur music. But that, of course, in a lot of ways, ends up being um, relevant to what's happening now. You just heard Roshan say that kind of, you know, artists, um, cultural elite, the intellectual elite are in many ways targets of, of this campaign, you know, of what has been happening to Uyghurs. Um, and I've certainly seen that impacting um, people I, you know, did my research with when I lived in the region and so forth. So there, there are very... Mm -hmm personal elements for me in some ways um, that are there are like a through line from my academic work to here but also intellectual issues and, and questions about and just human <laughs> issues and human questions about rights and the, what does it mean to have the right to you know be who you are speak the language you want practice the culture you want to practice or practice the religion that you want to practice um, what does it mean to have those things taken away from you so those are some of the through lines but yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, so we'll move to our first question, which is also a question that, as you can see, has come from one of our audience members, uh, Brother Mohammed Aziz, one of our uh, mentors and leaders in the Devon area and the Devon Masjid. He asks, uh, so what is the current situation? And again, if you were to imagine someone who may not be following the news very closely, but just hearing about the Uyghur crisis, um, what is life like for, uh, for the Uyghur people in East Turkestan uh, currently on a day-to-day -day basis? And a connected question to this is, what are, how do you communicate with people on the ground or are you not able to communicate with people on the ground? What are some ways to receive news from the field given the restrictions that are imposed by the Chinese government? Um, I can just say uh, briefly uh, mention about what is happening today. Um, let's talk about just regular people like you and me. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not talking about the ones in the camps, but just the daily lives for regular people. Anybody have read the George Orwell's uh, 1984? Uh, that is the, uh, the basically the reality in East Turkestan today. Complete surveillance police state. And the um, China is waging a war on religion, uh, basically. They are outlining everything, not just the religious, normal religious activities, but also um, our uh, like Uyghur identity or uh, any kind of the you know, 
practicing uh, your normal culture um, using the Uyghur language, basically, and the, uh, everybody's forced to speak Chinese. Um, uh, the Uyghur women are forced to marry Han Chinese people, Uyghur girls, because if they say uh, no to uh, such a forced arranged marriage by the government, they are being labeled as uh, uh, refusing to marry non-Muslim Han Chinese. So the in fear of uh, sending to the, uh, the concentration camps, they are marrying to somebody who they don't love or they don't want to. So if a girl cannot choose who she wants to marry or who she doesn't want to marry, what do you call that? That is rape in the shame of marriage. And also uh, 1.1 million Han Chinese cadres deployed to Uyghur homes to live inside of people's houses, to monitor and to supervise their daily lives. Most of the men are taken to either concentration camps or slave labor facilities or prisons. The, the women are subject to sexual abuse. So basically the tragedy for the just regular people while their religion is being stigmatized and the, uh, their ethnic identity is being uh, demonized by the government, um, everybody is living under fear. In the camps, mm -hmm. intense indoctrination, forced um, uh, uh, mental and physical torture, and people are uh, forced to forsake their religion and ethnic identity in you know, dehydration and also uh, not enough nutrition and the um, very crowded rooms. We are seeing some of the pictures of uh, um, so many you know, people are crowded to one room. So not only China is uh, waging um, a war on Islam and the, uh, they're also waging war on democracy and freedom, the information blockade because of the information blockade is extremely uh, difficult to get any kind of uh, information. And now, Whatever is happening in East Turkestan, the tragedy of the Uyghurs is not just confined to us alone. And this will be the future of the entire world if China is not being stopped. Because Beijing has infiltrated the Western universities and the UN and the NBA and the IOC and the Hollywood. In short, basically China is aiming to take down the democracy across the world. The consequences of failing to address this uh, monstrous threat will be disastrous for humanity. And how we are getting the information, there are many people in the region who sent out very subtle videos and messages via uh, Chinese social medias. And sometimes they are just uh, um, jeopardizing their lives, their own safety to send out some of the messages. And then some others are leaking information like uh, uh, Dr. Alice Anderson mentioned earlier um, the Karkash documents and the, the 403 pages leaked documents and the, the also um, there is like another set of documents uh, which is the, like um, basically uh, uh, you know the operating manuals for those camps. There are three sets of leaked documents, government's own documents. So they are not just the something that I am saying as an activist or somebody else is saying from one of the Uyghur organizations, those are hardcore evidence came from the Chinese government themselves. That's why there's still people, especially uh, from some of the, uh, uh, our Muslim brothers and sisters, uh, like I have been trying to convince this one person from uh, Palestine origin in New York, living in the United States, still believing China's disinformation and the false narratives. And he tells me after all these documents, sending him all this information, he tells me that, uh, well, China's uh, not having any issue with religion. Uh, they are just the, uh, fighting the uh, radicalized Muslims uh, among the Uyghurs. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, we, we as, we, as I said, you know, it's really difficult to get information without risking the contact life or their family members um, because of our knowledge of how China suppresses the information. 
uh, when we do get the news or something, we can be certain that it's much worse and the, on a much uh, larger scale than what it is being presented. Just I recently talked to one of the um, um, former inmates who came out of the uh, concentration camp living here in Virginia. Her husband was telling me that um, they lived there and they just came back last year. Mm -hmm. okay. They were saying that, um, let me just add, you know, finish with this. They were saying that everything we are saying here is only like 10% of what's actually being, uh, what's happening. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. If I could jump in and just add or put it, put some things in my own words, right? Um, and add a little bit, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, I think one way one big level way that's helpful. There's so much going on, right? The, and you just heard some of that, that it can feel dizzying. And, and you think like, what, how does this all fit together? If you want to ask what life is like on the day to day, whether we're talking about someone who's in some form of detention or disappearance, or we're talking about people who are ostensibly free and on the outside, Uyghurs are living in a state of unfreedom no matter where they are and no matter you know inside or outside there are, as i as i mentioned there are various kinds of detention so someone might be in a camp in a temporary holding center known as a detention center mass internment is on the rise children are being put into state-run facilities in some cases people are in forced labor schemes etc but there's so much surveillance on the outside recent evidence recent reporting came from rfa's Uyghur service about um, apartment blocks that the authorities have moved formerly detained people into so they're not even able to go back and live in their own home they're living in a state assigned apartment block maybe in the county seat of whatever county they're from, right? Just levels and layers of unfreedom are, are shaping the contours of your life. Um, and, you know, pervasive surveillance system, which bolsters all of this, you know, continues to loom over people's heads and over their, their lives. And that surveillance makes it difficult to communicate with people on the ground. But, you know, the authorities have tried to, create an information vacuum. They haven't been 100% successful at that because some of the same technologies that they're using to oppress are also allowing things to get out, right? So we get uh, one Uyghur advocate, his name is Arslan Hidayet, has likened some of the messages that people are risking themselves to send out to messages in a bottle, right? People are just kind of throwing things out in the ocean, hoping they'll stick. Um, so the things people post on social media have been, you know, from China have been very valuable in getting evidence out as well as these higher level document leaks. But um, like on a personal level, I no longer have contact with my, my friends, my teachers, my classmates from the region because it's, it's simply too risky. Um, a qu question, if I may, um, since the onsen, onset of the pandemic, have either of you felt um, a balancing act in, on the one hand, um, dealing with the COVID situation and the other hand, not trying to fall into the anti-Chinese um, bigotry that has um, often been mouthed by the, um, by the president? And I wonder if you feel that there's a, a balancing act that needs to be undertaken now so that one can still protest um, and act in solidarity um, with the Uyghur community, but not fall into the rhetoric used by this administration, um, which often uses uh, China as a scapegoat. That's a, uh, that's a great, question and I think a really important one and um, I you know you posed it as a balancing act and and for me personally I don't know if it even needs to be a balancing act so much as just an issue of consistency <laughs> with seeing people as uh, as human across the board and and you know seeing people as different from the governments that conscript them into things or you know rule over them or shape the contours 
of their lives. I, you know, I've had the privilege to read on Twitter and on, you know, news websites, you know, pieces by Chinese Americans and Chinese people in the U.S., you know, pointing out the ways that, that coronavirus and the way people speak about it are having negative impacts on them personally, um, harming their physical as well as emotional well-being and safety. And so, you know, I think it's up to us to take that seriously. And again, be consistent with the values that we, that we say we hold. And people in governments are not one and the same. And, and I think that can derive from our, our broader respect for human rights. Thank you. Thank you, Elise, for that. Um, just, I just want to add uh, mm -hmm. in a little uh, uh, the, my view to this is um, mm. um, many people looking at uh, this as like a political issue, but when you look, you know, the, what's happening to the Uyghur people and the, what the Chinese government is doing, and now uh, the mentioning about COVID-19, there is a, like a credible report also we cannot verify um, but uh, there's a very good chance that the, the Chinese government is using Uyghurs as the uh, guinea pigs, testing the vaccines on the Uyghurs now, locking down the entire city of Urumqi and the other parts. Um, so this is not a uh, political issue, political situation, but this is a human rights crisis that now developed into active genocide. The Chinese people are also became the victims of China's disinformation and the false narratives, just like um, most of our uh, Muslim Ummah and the Muslim majority countries, and the, even those Muslim majority uh, countries, governments and the leaders. The Chinese government is not telling them that uh, they have a concentration camps that they are running and they are enslaving most of the Uyghurs and putting uh, three million Uyghur people in the concentration camps because of their religion and their, their ethnic identity. They are lying to them. They are uh, not only investing millions and the billions of dollars in these countries to buy their silence and the compliance is out, but also at the same time, they are spreading the disinformation about the actual situation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just sadly, this has been uh, far um, from, uh, you know, um, China is, you know, this is not the first time China is doing this, but uh, China has used its new position of the economic uh, powers to ramp up its persecution of the Uyghurs and Tibetans and Mongolians and what's happening in Hong Kong right now. And the other religious groups, um, they, all of them are uh, becoming the victims of the uh, Chinese Communist Party. Mm -hmm. I think also if I can add, I, I will be quick, um, just we can see how so many of these major issues, the, the, so the, the weaker issue on the one hand and then the you know, coronavirus as a global pandemic are, are intimately linked. And you know, all the ways coronavirus is raging through the United States right now are, is, is intimately connected to this crisis, I'll say again. And you know, just one example of that is evidence we found that Uyghur forced laborers are likely making masks and other PPE. They are making masks and other PPE, and those things might be making their way to the United States for our own response to this coronavirus. And so I think, you know, this exposes a lot um, about the world, but, uh, and, and really is, is challenging us all with, you know, our our response in some ways. No, thank you to, to both of you. And I think this, this takes us to, to one of the questions that our audience can see when you click the Q&A button. As you can see, there are several questions that have come in and you have addressed some of them. But uh, I think two questions address a specific point, which is what can we do here in the United States as Muslim Americans or as Muslims who live here in the United States what are some ways that organ at the organizational level, at the individual level, uh, one can um, help or learn from the Uyghur organizations? Um, and, and of course, you know, connected to this is the ongoing uh, Chinese propaganda, sometimes enlisting relatives of, 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 of Uyghur leaders as well, as one of the questions uh, from Andrea Batang um, notes here. 
what are some ways, in other words, that again, an everyday person who's concerned, who is now informed, thinks to, to both of you about this crisis can take? What are some resources that we can uh, lead them to? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I can jump in because I'm looking at a list right now. <laughs> sure. Prepared a list to, to keep myself on topic and answering this question. So um, one way, a little bit of promotion. If you go to uhrp.org, we have a page on our website titled What You Can Do, which will provide you with some links and some suggestions. So keep that in mind. Bookmark it for later. I'll also just go ahead and share. Definitely Definitely, please ask your mosque um, and other organizations you're part of to endorse a global campaign for fashion brands to end complicity in Uyghur forced labor. Uh, you can ask your senator to co-sponsor the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. You can donate to Uyghur organizations um, that are working on this cause and fighting for the Uyghur people, like Campaign for Uyghurs, like the Uyghur Human Rights Project, the World Uyghur Congress. We can really use your support in that way. Uh, follow Uyghurs on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram. They're telling their stories and sharing them widely. Uh, and there are also a lot of good pet petitions that are out there. So the UHRP What You Can Do page links to some of those. Um, I could also send them to CARE to circulate if, if that's something people are interested in. Thank you. So we'll be happy to circulate, Risha. Thank you, Elise, for that. And I've posted the, the link to the UHRP website. Um, just to add to, uh, those are really great points. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Alice. And the, I would like to also add the boycott Chinese goods and the companies who are profiting of uh, uh, silence on the Uyghur slave labor. When you see made in China, just remember those are made with Uyghur slave laborers. So try not to buy anything that's made in China and continue to raise awareness and speak to your uh, legislators about those uh, uh, the bill that uh, Alice just mentioned, and also uh, there's another one, the Santa uh, Holly's anti-slavery slavery bill is also a very important legislature that is a, a legislation that is connected to uh, the Uyghur slave laborers. And we need to also a part of it regarding to uh, CCP's infiltrations in foreign universities, especially we've got all these Confucius institutes everywhere in the United States. Um, now we, we just uh, recently, uh, in, you know, the, the U.S. Uh, actually um, uh, recognized them as a foreign mission, but that, that does not create enough of a precedent for the universities and for the, their operation because they renamed the uh, university. Universities renamed those Confucius Institutes now uh, to like a, a culture and the language uh, program or something like that. So uh, that actually uh, using our uh, freedom and the platform here we have in America, um, spreading basically uh, disinformation and the Chinese uh, uh, totalitarian ideologies. And also, um, uh, CCP propaganda outlets like uh, the Global Times Network and the, the other, uh, there are some uh, cable networks that people are paying to watch those uh, CCP's propagandas. And we all should also initiate um, such as to boycott the uh, 2022 Beijing Olympics, a country holding 3 million people because of their religion, because of their ethnicity and the background and does not qualify to host Olympic Games. So there is a no right, no game uh, hashtag to emphasize that uh, allowing a genocidal regime uh, like uh, China uh, should not be hosting uh, Olympic Games. And also you can write to the, uh, uh, the IOC for that. And the plus, we should also support um, legislative efforts to hold the UN and the other entities accountable as well. Um, China has been given a seat on the UN Human Rights Council panel. Can you imagine? China is on the UN Human Rights Council panel with upcoming votes on their appointment now recently, you know, on the on a, uh, near future. 
we must call on countries to uh, abstain from voting as appointment. We should also mm -hmm. continue to pressure the organization, the Islamic Corporation, to act. The Ummah is desperately uh, needed, uh, hosting awareness events like this one, uh, and also encouraging Imams to speak. Almost every Juma prayer should include du'as and the raising awareness on this issue. The Imams um, should uh, step up, the most importantly, to share and to speak the truth uh, regarding what's happening to the Uyghurs. And many mm -hmm. uh, powerful organizations like yourself and the individuals have been uh, uh, raising awareness, but also there are so many the Muslim organizations has been silenced by uh, China's money and the, uh, that the ashtray by China's campaign of disinformation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh -huh. No, thank you. And I know that this is exhausting, especially for, for both of you who are very close to the subject. Uh, actually, on just that, that, that theme earlier today, one of the community members reached out to us saying that, hey, you're hosting this session on Zoom, but Zoom as a platform is also implicated in censoring and in, um, in canceling accounts of activists on the ground, which is, of course, another concern for us and we appreciate uh, that that feedback. Um, so I am sure there are many others like this. I'm seeing one question from Brother Osama Fasam, who is uh, who is our care uh, Pennsylvania board president, who asks uh, a kind of a, inviting us to take a step back, asking about the population of the Uyghurs, both in East Turkestan and also in the United States, and maybe this gives us an opportunity to talk a little bit about the the Uyghur community here in the United States. What are some states where there is concentration of the Uyghur community? What are some ways that this community connects to one another? And also not only in yes, the United uh, States, the, but other parts of the, the globe as well. The population of the Uyghurs always have been minimized by the Chinese regime. Uh, when the actual number uh, was back in, uh, you know, years ago, like 30, 40 years ago, when it was, uh, 10 to 15 million, they always uh, had like six, seven million back then. And then, and now the government official numbers say 12 million, but uh, we know for a fact it's at least 20 to 25 million um, in, in East Turkestan. Uh, in the United States, um, there are about eight, eight to 10 million, I would say, uh, living in the United States and also um, uh, Saudi Arabia. Yeah, Central Asia, Europe, Australia, Turkey, Canada. Um, the, you know, in Turkey, we have the most uh, population there. So altogether, I would say it's more than a million in the diaspora. Um, so the most of the people uh, came to, if, if I just talk about the United States, when I first came over uh, back in the late uh, 1980s, the most Uyghurs were just coming as a students, graduate students, so to come study here. And then the second wave was after the uh, Kolja massacre in 1997, uh, many Uyghurs uh, arrived through Central Asia and the Turkey. And then again, the second uh, large wave was um, after 2009, Urumqi massacre, many youth, many the Uyghur uh, young, uh, generations came over as students. Um, and also uh, in the early 2000, uh, 2000 like between 2000 to 2010, uh, many uh, graduate students like PhDs and the, uh, the people who have um, uh, master's degrees uh, from Japan after they graduated, they moved over uh, during those times. So um, uh, population here in the United States, the Uyghur population, varies just the many young students who really needs uh, help young generation here, and any kind of help from the communities. And also uh, we have uh, like uh, well-known uh, scientists and working in a very respectful places. Yeah, it's interesting. It's so hard to know those numbers, but fortunately the U.S. census, <laughs> um, Oh, I'm forgetting the details of it now, but some of the, the census numbers that are taken in, in between, you know, the big census like we're doing this year, um, you know, reveal things like self-reported first language spoken at home. 
and that has been very useful. So this figure of, you know, maybe eight to 10,000, maybe even more now because those numbers are a little bit outdated. We know those figures from, from that self-reported first language at home um, information from the U.S. Census. And, you know, Uyghurs have been settling here and starting families, right? And that has helped that community to grow and flourish. You asked the question, Ahmed, of, you know, what state are they or what area are they most settled in? And it's actually this area that Roshan and I are speaking to you from <laughs> here in D.C. that is, is the largest mm -hmm. It's kind of Euler land in the United States. Um, so Virginia in particular, uh, but also to some extent in, in DC and Maryland as well. Absolutely. So. Many great Uyghur restaurants uh, in, that, in that area. Um, maybe that, that also connects us uh, at least to a question that I want us to, to address, which is how are the Uyghur people in general? What is the impact of, first of all, the repression and the oppression and the situation on the culture and the civilization and the transmission of these and how are people who are in the diaspora keeping their traditions, their music, um, their, their cultural aspects all, and all of that alive um, while experiencing uh, such harsh uh, conditions on the, at the same time. Yeah, this is um... This is a, a heavy and, and large question that I hope we, I can do justice to, but um, you know, the, the situation for the survival of Uyghur culture feels really dire. You know, there, I last visited the region in 2018, um, and you know, I was heartened in some way to see that people were speaking the Uyghur language, but that doesn't mean it had a place left in, you know, formal institutional settings anymore, or that it ha really had, you know, a place left as a language of instruction and the language of production and so forth. Um, and so, you know, based on the sort of, for me, I look at music a lot, right? And I can see that there's a lower, a much lower level of musical activity and it's a different kind of musical activity that there has been before. And that coupled with the erasure of Uyghur language from so many formal spaces and contexts, you know, means it's, it's, it's worrisome. We also heard about campaigns where, you know, books in the Uyghur language were taken away and burned and a lot of bookstores were shut down. Bookstores that were still open barely had anything left when I visited in 2018. So it looks, it looks pretty dire in the region from the best that we can tell. You know, in the diaspora, people are, have been establishing language schools, not just over the last few years. Those efforts have been going on for a long time among Uyghurs in Australia, across Europe, also here in the United States. People are forming ensembles. If you look at social media, you can actually find amazing, wonderful accounts across Twitter and Instagram and other places that celebrate Uyghur cuisine, Uyghur music, Uyghur dance, Uyghur culture. Um, but, you know, a lot of that is having to, it, it's taking place in a, a separate, a completely separate social media ecosystem, right? And in a, in a con mm -hmm. completely separate set of environments spread across the world, which creates some challenges. And it's, these are things, these are efforts that people are making in their spare time from their full-time jobs, um, usually underfunded woefully underfunded. So those things present mm -hmm. challenges at the same time that those efforts are absolutely important and doing a tremendous amount of good work. Mm -hmm. uh, and a qu connected question um, just, just came in, in the Q&A. Um, and and Rishan, please feel free to also address this, but I just wanted to highlight that question from Andy about Tang, a question about, you know, what are some ways to learn the Uyghur language in, um, in either different language programs or at the university level, are there such programs that might help slow down the erasure of the language? Yeah, Alice can answer to that because you know she learned such a beautiful Uyghur, but let me just uh, um, add mm -hmm. to about the, the Uyghur culture and the heritage part. You know, what's happening in East Turkestan today is the communist uh, uh, Chinese uh, government's version of the Holocaust final solution, basically. Um, a high-level Chinese official, Hu Lianghe, said that the Uyghur problem must be taken to the final solution stage. And we are facing the complete extermination of our culture and the denial of our uh, history and, the, and everything, actually, the heritage. Um, 
to say this is a, a challenge is a understatement. Actually, we are facing genocide and our uh, bloodline is being bred out, basically. The only aspect of our uh, heritage is uh, that um, uh, is allowed to be displayed are the uh, false propaganda of the Uyghurs uh, dancing uh, in the rehearsed scenes or from those uh, uh, concentration camps, so-called, you know, the education as uh, vocational training centers and also having uh, Han Chinese people dancing around in the Uyghur clothes and the Uyghur uh, dances on the streets and completely uh, uh, inauthentic and uh, disgusting in their use, these beautiful culture uh, to lie about uh, China's genocide. Everything that made the Uyghurs unique as our, our ethnic identity, our culture, our language, and our religion is being viewed as abnormalities by the uh, Chinese government. Beijing's ambassador to uh, US, Sui Tianqui, ambassador Sui Tianqui, he openly told the CNN about two years ago, this was November 2018. Um, if you Google CNN, you can see this, that by putting the Uyghurs into those so-called re-education centers, he said they want to make Uyghurs into normal persons. Imagine that. They looked at our culture and the, our religion and our you know, history, everything that made us unique as abnormality, treated us as abnormal commodities. So what heritage will we have left unless if we start to act and take tangible action to stop this genocide? Yeah, I think that's, thank you for, for adding that. And I think it's, you know, it's important to realize there are ways that Uyghur culture in, um, in the Uyghur homeland gets sort of taken away from Uyghurs and packaged in a certain way and put on display for the tourist gaze, for the sake of making money, for the sake of making it look like, oh, we're protecting this culture, right? We're preserving it. Um, those things very much do happen and they're deeply misleading for people who don't know what they're looking at when they see it. And it's also, those sorts of things are deeply offensive to Uyghur culture and to people, you know, Uyghurs themselves, right, who love and want to practice this culture. Um, to the question about um, language erasure or language loss here in the United States um, and elsewhere throughout the diaspora, I know that there are people who, there are efforts underway to create some more standardized curricula for the teaching of the Uyghur language just to determine you know like what's the what should be the benchmark at this level how do we you know know what benchmarks should even be there and how we're meeting them so efforts are underway and people are talking with one another across uh you know different countries across borders to figure out what that looks like and there are universities in the u.s that are still teaching the language indiana washington kansas and harvard last i checked also university of wisconsin sometimes in the summer um, so any or up to all of you could learn the Uyghur language if you were so interested. Um, and then there are also the schools run primarily with, you know, Uyghur heritage speakers as their target. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you for that to, to both of you. Uh, we have one uh, final question from Brother Sama. We'll get that and then we'll get some closing remarks from you. And I'll ask it again if you can guide us towards, you know, concrete action. Uh, we would be grateful for that. So the question is, are you seeing a growing support at the Senate and the Congress, the House, or, or is the Chinese hold slash interest overriding the support for the Uyghurs? I mean, I think the Uyghur issue is one of the very few issues that has managed to be bipartisan and to garner very wide bipartisan support um, throughout, you know, both sides of the U.S. Congress. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't see, you know, other things as overriding that support from the United States. Roshan, do you have anything to add? 
Um, I think you put it in very nicely. Uh, yes, this is actually, um, uh, as I mentioned, you know, this shouldn't be viewed as a political issue, and that's how it's being uh, treated now. Both parties are uh, really supporting. Um, and we really hope to see, continue to, you know, see the both parties pushing forward on the uh, uh, taking the government and the administration to take tangible actions. And also um, uh, not only United States, but uh, when they are working with other same minded uh, shared valued countries, all the Western democratic countries, it's there, everybody. are being the first victim look at us just look at our today and that this is the future for the world actually especially the muslim majority countries we have direct stake um, because china is waging war on islam and the uh, whatever they are doing to uyghurs today they are going to do that to all other uh, muslim majority countries because any kind of original thought and the, anything that's above and beyond the Communist uh, Party ideologies is threat to that uh, totalitarian regime. And also, China is openly announcing to the world that they are rewriting the Holy Quran and the Bible and the uh, Vatican and the other uh, the leaders from the, uh, the Muslim world are being silent. Countries, uh, short term, you know, internal politics. Thank you. Thank you so much for this. What I am uh, doing, and sorry again about the community issues here, is to, to post again the, the links to, um, to, to both organizations' websites, and at the same time, to post the link to the Contest of the Fruits project at Haverford College. Um, I want to give uh, Jacob, um, if you want to, a few final words before we give the final floor to our panelists. Um, but I wanted to do a shout out to Gang Xinha again, to Brother Carlin Safir, one of our own board members who has been a passionate advocate on behalf of the, the Uyghur cause in Philadelphia and beyond, and his wife, Sister Rukaya, as well. They've spent many hours uh, in the Masajid. Uh, in, in areas um, as our elder African-American, um, one of the founders of Care Philadelphia, Brother Carlin. Um, and, and I wanted to thank him um, again for his efforts. Um, so uh, I think what, what we'll do is, Jacob, if you can, um, uh, if you can kindly um, um, say a few words and then I'm seeing one question. I, I can't, res I can't but, but ask this uh, that just came in, is, which is that, does the Uyghur Human Rights Bill, is it helpful for Uyghur asylum seekers? Uh, so that's the question. So is in your closing remarks, if you can highlight this after Jacob uh, says a few words, we'll appreciate it and then we'll wrap up our program. Thank you, Ahmed. Uh, thank you to uh, Rushan and Elise. Um, it's been a pleasure listening to you. Um, sometimes, although the report is sad, um, people hearing this can be motivated to address the situation. And that's one of the reasons that CARE does webinars like this. Um, even though they're foreign issues and we are still primarily a domestic organization, we feel connected both um, being a part of the uh, UMA, um, Worldwide Muslim Community, but also because we feel that any persecuted people should be our responsibility. And that silence or turning one's head is not an avenue to address um, evil or persecution. Uh, the evils that we see in the world can only be addressed by activism, um, and courage, which the two of you have brought to us in abundance. So we thank you again. Um, we hope you will come back um, in better times to report more 
about the situation of the Uyghur in China uh, and also in the diaspora. So again, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so Jacob. much, uh, Jacob and the care for yeah, putting this uh, panel together. Um, yes, this uh, pandemic uh, created a lot of uh, uh, challenges for our, our advocacy work, but uh, we are continuing to do uh, uh, giving us this opportunity. And when I talk about this pandemic, I want to quickly also address this, the pandemic, which uh, the CCP deliberately suppressed the information information and uh, punishing the whistleblowers and the uh, uh, creating this uh, epidemic from one city to now this global pandemic. This should be a wake-up call. A country that um, can unleash uh, this on to the world with uh, no remorse and uh, who can lie about something like this. And now today, it, more than um, over 20 million people are infected and it caused more than 750,000 deaths in the world today, cannot be trusted on any level. The Americans are uh, quick to find fault uh, with our own country. And the, um, uh, you know, there are a lot going on, but that is a good thing. It means that we can self-criticize and the, uh, improve our system. But when people have the uh, naive assumption of uh, that our system, while it's not perfect, but somehow worse than China's communist system, well, that type of thinking is disastrous for our future. It's harmful to the country. Um, we are getting attacked right and left from people um, when I see the Americans, actually some of the Americans are defending uh, Chinese system using our freedom platforms here. It just it worries me for the future of our world. And our uh, faith, um, Islam teaches us that we are all uh, will be asked at the end, what did we do when we knew it? We need to act in accordance with our humanity and our conscience because this what's happening to Uyghurs today is a test for the uh, conscience of the world. Thank you. Yes, thank you for those remarks. Um, I put a link rundown of what the act does provide provision for. Um, you could see that in, in the one pager on the UHRP website that I linked to. Um, and just know that there are organizations and people working pretty tirelessly to try to, to find protections and provide protections for Uyghur asylum seekers. And that maybe segues nicely into the, the closing comment I want to make, which is just that it's, it's very easy for a variety of reasons to forget about Uyghurs and to forget about the human aspect of this whole thing we're even talking about in the first place. Um, there are Uyghurs across the world who are experiencing an unimaginable loss. To most of us, it's unimaginable. Other Uyghurs themselves are living it. And uh, we need to listen to their voices and put them back at the center of this, right? So it is up to us. We can listen, we can act in empathy, we can center and recenter and amplify those voices. Uyghurs have been risking their lives, risking their emotional well-being to practically scream at the world. And so, you know, I, I urge all of you and all of us to listen and, and really give a place of importance to those voices. Thank you. Wonderful. We are grateful to you both for, for your wonderful remarks, for your expertise. Again, uh, please check out the chat. And it's a testament that this has been one of our best attended webinars so far uh, with such interaction, despite the fact that we couldn't go live on Facebook, uh, but we will definitely post the video recording there. Again, thank you to, to all of you. Thank you to, to many of the local Uyghur leaders, Robert Austin here in Allentown, to Dr. Rashad and, and, and many others uh, um, here in this area for keeping us alive.
Um, I want to, to give a shout out to two programs that are coming up. One is part of the Haverford College's Contest of the Fruits project, together with Gangshan, with 12 Gates Art, uh, Care Philadelphia, and Haverford College. We are having an Uyghur poetry session at the end of August, so please be on the look for, for that with many Uyghur leaders, uh, Uyghur poets, and, and many others uh, will be featured. Uh, and a second program is next week. We are hosting another webinar, this time on the Kashmir crisis uh, and the situation um, there uh, with Hafsa uh, Kanjwal from Lafayette College and with Dr. Uh, Sabina Fazli from, from Philadelphia, Kashmir American uh, advocate and poet. Um, so again, thank you, uh, Rushan Abbas of Campaign for Uyghurs. Thank you, Elise Anderson, Dr. Anderson of Uyghur Human Rights Project for this. Thank you to all of you for joining us. Uh, we'll definitely make sure to amplify and uplift the, the Uyghur uh, cause and, and activism around it. Have a great evening. Yeah, thank you thank so you. much. Thanks. Thank Bye to all. Bye.